Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, is brought to you by the members of the John Adams. Why not become a member yourself, or even better, a patron, and enjoy all the extras and benefits? Find out more at john-adams.nl, john-adams.nl, and click on Become a Member. From Amsterdam, this is Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, a treasure trove of the best and the brightest of American thinking. And our next guest thinks Facebook CEO might have delusions of grandeur. Mark Zuckerberg, he fancies himself in the likeness of Caesar Augustus. Mark Zuckerberg has said, and I paraphrase, look, Caesar Augustus, through some pretty harsh means, did establish a big period of peace and did establish an empire. People remember him. He had great impact. Mark Zuckerberg definitely sees Facebook as something with historical impact. And Mark Zuckerberg said, it's better to be understood than to be liked. New York Times tech reporter Cecilia Kang's book, The Ugly Truth, looks at what makes Meta and Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg tick. Who is he actually? What motivated him to become one of the richest, most influential men on earth? And how did Facebook itself get to be such a powerful force? sometimes for good and, just as often, so socially disruptive. Kang, together with fellow reporter Shira Frankel, reveals how Facebook's algorithms sacrificed everything for user engagement and profit while creating a misinformation epicenter that not only violates its users' privacy, but also promotes extreme ideologies. NRC Handelsblad tech reporter Wouter van Noort interviewed Kang back in October of 2021. But first, she told our Amsterdam audience that she and her co-author, Shira Frankel, came to the conclusion that Facebook's and its parent company Meta's missteps were not an anomaly. They were an inevitability. Why? Because Facebook was built that way. Here's Cecilia Kang. Thank you so much for that. Um, But let me start with a reading. We connect people, period. That's why all the work we do in growth is justified. That can be bad if they make it negative, meaning the users. Maybe it costs someone a life by exposing someone to bullies. Maybe someone dies in a terrorist attack coordinated on our tools. And still we connect people. The ugly truth is that we believe in connecting people so deeply that anything that allows us to connect more people more often is de facto good. So I'm reading from a memo written by a senior executive who's now the chief technology officer at Facebook. His name is Andrew Bosworth. The title of the memo is The Ugly. This is the inspiration for our title. And we believe this is really the nub of the Facebook story. They believe so strongly in growth. He says connecting the world and connecting people. We've come to believe, Shira and myself, that that's a euphemism, really, for growth and connecting and um, profitability, actually. That they're willing to deal with the collateral damage that comes with this headlong pursuit of growth. And that's the calculus in which every decision is made. So why did we decide to write this book? There is endless coverage of Facebook. There's such a saturation of Facebook news. Um, I'll stop. start in... 2018, November, and a story that we wrote an investigation for the New York Times, Shira and myself and some other colleagues called Delay, Deny, and Deflect. I don't know if anybody here in the room read that story, but it was an investigation into what actually was happening within the company that led to Russian interference on the website ahead of the 2016 election, as well as the data privacy abuses related to Cambridge Analytica. What were the leaders thinking? What was the decision-making process? And what we found there was a pattern. And it's the pattern that was just read on the back of the book. It was a pattern at the company of a big problem or scandal emerging, executives apologizing to the public and promising to do better, sometimes saying, really, the problem is not as bad as you think. And look at YouTube and look at TikTok and look at these other companies that are just as bad but that pattern repeating itself. Then another big problem, big scandal emerging, more apologies, and sort of wash, rinse, and repeat. So Cher and I wanted to understand what is behind this pattern. There has to be something that explains why this is happening. It can't just be one slip up after another. It's just too endemic to what's happening. 
So we believe you have to start with the leadership, and I think you have to start at Harvard with Mark, the Mark Zuckerberg story, which is really well known by now. I think many people here have watched the movie The Social Network, which actually got a lot right, actually. <laughs> Maybe something's not so right, but it, it really holds up, and I think that Harvard's an important place to start because that's where, face, where Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, created at what it was at that time called The Facebook, the precursor to what we have today is the app. During that time, he explained to a friend, you know, what I want is people to just be on all the time. I want people to be engaged. We're, I'm thinking about the Facebook. It's like MTV. Who remembers MTV in the audience? I don't know if this is a really young audience or an older. Okay, well, I remember MTV. I'm the older audience. So meaning like you just had MTV playing in the background. You, never, you maybe necessarily didn't watch the videos, but you're just always kind of like mindlessly listening and maybe... <laughs> peering once in a while and paying attention. But the point is you always had it on and it was constantly scrolling. And he thought that was the power of what, of what he had created, which was it was just so interesting enough that people would like keep it on and scroll. And that's what he wanted. He also very early on understood the power of attention and the power of data. And I'll read from some text messages that he sent, an exchange actually, with another Harvard student, Andrew, um, uh, what Adam Greenspan at Harvard. This is a text message back and forth. Zuck, I have over 4,000 emails, pictures, and addresses and SMSs. Friend, what? How'd you manage that one? Zuck, people just submitted it. Zuck, I don't know why. Zuck, they trust me. Zuck, dumb fucks. He understood that he had something that was really irresistible, that people wanted to know about each other and they wanted to express themselves online. And that was an incredibly powerful thing. Um, to understand how Facebook grew to what it is today, you have to understand his second in command, Sheryl Sandberg. And the story with Sheryl Sandberg begins in 2008 when she joined Facebook as the chief operating officer. She was already a titan in business in Silicon Valley. She was an ad executive at Google, incredibly successful. And she was there to do a couple of things. She was there to actually create a disciplined business out of Facebook and to be the adult in the room, to actually be a check on Mark's less good impulses. And that was what investors liked. That's what the public seemed to like. And she was an important figure in that way. So a couple of weeks after she started, she developed the business model. And I think this is a really important part of understanding the Facebook story. She gathered a lot of senior executives into a conference room at what was then their headquarters in Palo Alto. And she said, she wrote one up to a whiteboard. It was an evening meeting with the top executives. Mark happened to be away on one of his first trips outside of the US. He did a sojourn for one month, giving her the room that she needed to establish herself, but also he wanted to see the world a little bit. So she went to a whiteboard and she wrote, what business are we in? So it was sort of a wipe the slate clean. Let's like just be creative. I want to hear from everybody. What kind of business are we in? The executives in the room said, well, we don't want to charge. We're not a subscription business. So obviously we're an ad business. So established then. They were already an ad business, but confirmed then. We will continue to be an ad business. Okay, so fine. Behavioral advertising is just starting to take off. Data collection on the internet is just starting to take off with pop-ups, you know, cookies being dropped, that kind of thing. And she said, okay, but how are we going to differentiate ourselves? And she reminds you, she had just come from Google. And Google had mastered, and I'm going to get a little bit technical here, and I have actually a pro in advertising here, so if I might, I might make some mistakes here. But she understood what's known as, in marketing, is the funnel. And Google was at the bottom of the funnel, which is sort of where, where brands are and where people's consumers' minds are, are in this funnel. The bottom of the funnel is when an individual is really close to buying something. So Google, when you search on Google, you might say, like, I'm looking for a plane ticket to Bermuda. Then all the advertisers behind the scene that are running the auction or bidding on the auction will say, well, I actually sell Bermuda shorts. I have a hotel in Bermuda. I have all these different things. This person is so close to buying the advertising, the buying those plane tickets. I'm going to serve up my ads to that person because they're pretty close to buying also those Bermuda shorts as well as that hotel ticket, et cetera. That's a part of the market that Google owned. 
So Sheryl Sandberg said, we can't own that part. We've got to own a different part of the funnel. So she said, we want the top of the funnel. And the top of the funnel is important to understand because that's the part of the funnel where consumers are just sort of there and brands, advertisers are interested in just getting them interested in their brands. And to get that part of the funnel, you need a lot of information about people to win it in the online advertising space. And that's where Facebook began their model of intense data collection on individuals because they understood that in order, if you are Coca-Cola and you simply want to meet, make, make maybe a Pepsi drinker, somebody who's you know not so like into your brand, more of a Coca-Cola drinker, you need to know a lot more about that person so that Coca-Cola can better target their ads. So that was the start of what became this very important business model of getting more data off of the attention that Mark Zuckerberg already very clearly understood was so important and powerful about the site that he had developed. So that was the marriage between the business model and the technology. And the relationship, Shira and I like to think about it, is sort of like a marriage. They're very different people and they both bring very different things to this relationship. And they're so incredibly entwined in the success story of Facebook. Now, why it's important to understand that business model and the technology is because we have found in our reporting, and we talked to more than 400 people in our reporting, over many years of reporting, I've been covering Facebook. My first interview was in 2010 with Mark Zuckerberg. And at that time, he said, I would never invade somebody's privacy. This is not what I want to do. I'm not in that business, right? So to your point. Um, so I've been covering Facebook for a long time. And Shira, um, my partner, was a Middle East correspondent. Her first exposure to Facebook was in the Middle East when she was covering the Arab Spring. And she was there in Tahir Square when she saw people holding up posters saying, thank you, Facebook. I want to meet Mark Zuckerberg because this is a platform for great, wonderful, democratic systems and good. And I will stop and say, there are so many good purposes and applications that social media have. And that should not be missed. But there's something about the system and the business model that Facebook has built that makes it unique. Not completely unique, but stand out. And I think that's what's important about, that we, that's important to understand, and that's what we do in the book. So what are some of the things that we found in our book? We found that this headlong pursuit of growth and attention, because remember, Mark Zuckerberg, he's not only created this great technology, He's an incredibly competitive person. He fancies himself in the likeness of Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus is his hero. Mark Zuckerberg has said, and I paraphrase, look, Caesar Augustus, with some pretty harsh means, did establish a big period of peace and did establish an empire. And he's remember, you know, people remember him. He had great impact. Mark Zuckerberg definitely sees Facebook as something with historical impact. And Mark Zuckerberg said, it's better be, to be understood than to be liked. So he understands that all the criticism that Facebook is undergoing right now is just part and parcel to this calculus that I read in the very beginning in the ugly memo, that they will be criticized and bad things will happen. But in the end, it will be so historically important what he's creating, that he's willing to absorb those costs. So what has stemmed from that? I'll give a couple examples. In Myanmar, in 2014, human rights activists started warning Facebook executives, there's a big problem with disinformation. There's a big problem with the military and with Buddhist monks spreading disinformation about Muslims and the Rohingya. Facebook executives said, yeah, you know, this is important. We'll, we'll take this up the, up the chain and let people know. Reports were filed internally. There were a couple people who were warning, warning um, executives and raising red flags. But what did Facebook do through the period of 2014 when the warning signs were first emerging, even before then, through 2015 and 2016 when actual genocide occurred due to disinformation spread about, in large part, about Rohingya Muslims? They never increased the number of people they had speaking Burmese. They have one person located outside of Myanmar who speaks Burmese. And this is a country that has hundreds more than 100 languages spoken there, who does content moderation for them. 
So even catching what was happening and with these human rights activists warning what was happening, they weren't putting the people of Myanmar as a first priority. That's one example of what we believe and what we've heard directly from employees is the consequence of putting growth first and putting this business model first. Another example was in 2016, ahead of the US presidential elections, when security staff were seeing the first signs of the Internet Research Agency, which is tied to the Kremlin, that was spreading essentially a flood of fake news and information on Facebook. And they were trying to essentially organize chaos on the site. And the security team was warning Facebook executives vociferously waving their hands, this is a huge problem. This is a massive security problem. What they were told by the general counsel, the VP of communications is, I don't know, we don't know if it's conclusive, so we don't know if it's worth bringing it up to Mark, Mark Zuckerberg. And what we'd also heard from many top executives is what Mark doesn't know is probably good. So there's a culture of willful blindness that we discovered and a culture of where the, everyone is protecting the leader and everybody wants to get closer to the leader as well. And we believe, and we had heard directly from our sources that that was a huge frustration for the security team. And that was because putting security people in place is not net positive for growth, nor is it for, for their bottom line. It's not, it's not um, accredited. It's, it costs, right? So these are not the kinds of things you don't want your one exposure to a top executive to say, I really need to, I need $100 million for more security, you know? And that was, I think, a huge stumbling block for a huge hurdle for the security team. And the final example I would give of what we found of many examples of the pattern of people waving their hands and trying to warn of problems and top executives either ignoring or saying they understood but not acting on this, was in 2020 with the US presidential elections, where we saw after the election, a group called Stop the Steal. Has anybody heard of Stop the Steal? Okay, so Stop the Steal. They, they basically denied that the election was actually, the results were real, and they believe that Trump won in 2020. So Stop the Steal was effectively spreading misinformation about the election results. So Facebook started to try to take down some of these pages of, in these groups that were formed by Stop the Steal groups. And, but what they found was it was like they flourished these pages. It was like whack-a-mole, but they couldn't even keep up. They needed a much bigger hammer to like whack over these moles and they just could not, could not keep up. Because of the technology that Facebook had created, which was to amplify the most agitating speech the most agitating content, and to create groups and to encourage people to join Facebook groups that, that supported the Stop the Steal ideals and movement. Many of these people in the Stop the Steal movement went on to organize and to rally behind, at least online and in person, for the January 6th Capitol riots. January 11th comes. Sheryl Sandberg is asked in a Reuters interview, Tell us about Facebook's role in the Capitol riots. And her response was, sure, look, everybody has responsibility. But she said, the vast majority of the organizing for January 6th did not happen on Facebook. It happened on other platforms. This is, again, the denial and the pattern. And, you know, to, you know not to be, to, to her defense to some degree, there was absolutely organizing on other platforms, but to not take ownership, I think, was really important because their systems were so perfected to amplify this misinformation about the election through the newsfeed algorithms, through the group recommendations, and that's a key part of understanding the Facebook story, is the systems. So she denied it. What happened was, days later, the indictments came out for the Capitol rioters. One indictment after another, you can see their text message chains. You know, let's move to Facebook groups. Let's talk about this on Facebook Messenger. It was all there. Facebook was a very important platform for organizing around January 6th. So these are what we found all tied to the Facebook story, the pattern, 
And we found in our reporting that you can't really understand, and this goes back to why we wrote the book, you can't really understand the Facebook story without going back to this marriage that we talked about in the beginning of the technology and understanding the power of attention and engagement mixed with this incredibly powerful, perfect, beautiful, potentially dangerous business model that feeds off of that attention and makes, by our account, very many billions of dollars just on Monday in the last quarter. And I will finish this talk, this very cheerful talk, with this last, uh, <laughs> this last, uh, just the last lines of our book, because I think we really wanted to sum it up. Throughout Facebook's 17-year history, the social network's massive gains have repeatedly come at the expense of consumer privacy and safety and the integrity of democratic systems. And yet, that's never gotten in the way of its success. Zuckerberg and Sandberg built a business that has become an unstoppable profit-making machine that could prove too powerful to break up, even if regulators, or Zuckerberg himself, decided to one day end the Facebook experiment, the technology they have unleashed upon us is here to stay. One thing is certain, even if the company undergoes a radical transformation in the coming years, that change is unlikely to come from within. The algorithm that serves as Facebook's beating heart is too powerful and too lucrative. And the platform is built upon a fundamental, possibly, irreconcilable dichotomy. It's purported mission to advance society by connecting people while also profiting off them. It is Facebook's dilemma and its ugly truth. Thank you. And with that, NRSA Handelsblad tech reporter Valker von Nort took to the stage for a wide ranging talk about the power of the people who own and run social media's biggest company, starting with lean-in author Meta's number two and Mark Zuckerberg's right-hand woman, Sheryl Sandberg. So Sheryl Sandberg is incredibly sophisticated and polished as a public figure. You know, I I think that maybe many people here know that she used to be the chief of staff to former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers. Um, She worked at the World Bank, so she has a history in politics in Washington. She knows very well. She was in charge of the Washington operation. Um, And she is a very savvy business person. She successfully built AdWords and AdSense, the Google advertising business, into from something very small into a multi, multi multi-billion dollar business. And she's Uh, very good at public relations. uh, Very good at public relations. And, you know, interestingly, when she arrived, not only was she supposed to be the adult in the room and was she supposed supposed to build the business model, she was supposed to do all the things that Mark didn't want to do. Mark was just like, I just want to build the products. That's all I care about. It's the technology legal, public policy, communications, that kind of stuff I'm not interested in. And so all of that, Cheryl, you do, right? And she happily took it on. So her, her purview, if you will, was so vast, actually. And his was really like, he got to play with his toys. You know, he got to play with the technology. And she was in charge of like a lot. And arguably, and we show in the book, arguably not very well. She didn't, what, what surprised me, many things surprised us about our reporting on Sheryl Sandberg was she was not all that in tune with regulators in Washington. And we have this. In what way did she? she Yeah. I mean, there's this, well, not in tune. And also there, there was a lot of confidence in Facebook's power going into meetings with regulators. And I'll give an example. She went to um, the Federal Trade Commission in 2010. This was in the book. Yeah, it did make it. A lot got on the cutting room floor, so I've got to remember this made it in the book. She went to the Federal Trade Commission and met with the then chair, um, Jonathan Leibowitz. And Facebook was under investigation at the time for a program called Beacon, which is when they essentially like sh- exposed people's shopping habits on other websites on Facebook. People freaked out. It was a big privacy scandal. So Facebook became the subject of investigation at the FTC. So Sheryl Sandberg went to the FTC to tr- on a charm offensive, essentially. And she believed that, you know, to a large degree, her charm could win them over. And I don't mean that in like just a personality way, but just the, the charm of Facebook too, because also remember at that time, there was a halo around Facebook. Obama that same year visited Facebook to host a town hall, an Obama t- town hall at Facebook in 2010. Sheryl Sandberg incidentally rode on Air Force One with Obama to that, that, that town hall. I happened to cover the town hall in Palo Alto and it was just a love fest. 
You know, it was, you know, Facebook, you're wonderful. Connecting Mark, the world. Connecting the world. Mark gives, gives Obama a hoodie. You know, Obama like jokes about like getting Mark to wear a suit. And, you know, it's just like there's no critical thinking or criticism yeah. or even just like hard questions, you know, mm. in that time. So Cheryl Samper goes to the FTC, back to that story. And she essentially says like, look, we have the best privacy policy of any technology company because we provide so many options for how you can control your privacy settings. So many different levers. And so buttons. many, right? And, you know, also arguably the most confusing privacy policies because it is. And a lot of people didn't set their privacy policies, their privacy settings properly. But um, the, the regulators in the meeting said to her, you know, we're taking this really seriously. We don't believe what you're saying, you know, essentially, like we need you to justify, to back up what you're saying by like, having the strongest policy, privacy policies. And she kind of shifts gears and says, you know, look, you know, we care, we really want to work with the FTC and that kind of thing. And Jonathan Leibowitz said, even my teenage daughters are having trouble with these privacy settings. They accidentally are making their pro profiles much more public. This is a real problem, right? And Sheryl Sandberg's response, which I think was really amazing, is, and I think it's telling about how they view Washington and the amount of arguably hubris they have going into Washington, is that she said, oh, you know, that's so great that your teenagers are on Facebook, Because Facebook is so great for empowering youth. It's just a great place for young people to express themselves. And Jonathan Leibowitz said, you don't get me. I'm saying I am really worried about my kids right. that are on Facebook. And it was... it Was was it, was, it a blindness or a willful I blindness? I think it's a bit of, that was a blindness, but it shows that I think they went it, to Washington. Or is it part of the pattern? Of, of part of the pattern, of a lot of confidence, overconfidence. But in her defense... The Washington has never, even today, actually acted to hold these technology companies to account. So they were never really afraid of regulators. So I think that, like, I was surprised by, like, the way that she act, acted. It was less, um, with less humility than I expected, mm. given the position of a company that's regulated. As an adult in the room, she didn't behave very adult. You're yes, saying, yes, yeah. Uh, and the image arising from the book is that the adult has not left the room, but at least has been sidetracked yeah. quite significantly since, right? Yeah. So their relationship is, has been tested a lot. Um, going back to the fact that Sheryl Sandberg was assigned so many more responsibilities under Mark Zuckerberg, um, he blamed her for the, the PR fallout for Cambridge Analytica, as well as the Russian election interference. And What Shira and I found really fascinating about that, and even employees would say that themselves, is that that's vastly unfair in many ways, because yes, the PR fallout was bad and she should take responsibility for that, but those problems actually stem from his side of the business. They were product mistakes that resulted in hundreds and thousands of websites getting data so, from Yeah, Facebook. right. So, so uh, Cheryl had to clean up Mark's mess all the yes. time, basically, and while doing that, she was... Uh, some, something went amok in that relationship, right? Something went amok. She became afraid of pushing back. She became really um, concerned about her reputational decline, which we were seeing since, the, since 2006. We have seen since 2016. Um, Maybe it's good to, to tell that this is not gossip. Of course, a New York yes. Times journalist wouldn't do that, but this is based on thorough reporting. All uh, based on reporting. Sourced. This is all based on reporting for people around her. She has said numerous times, there's ultimately one person's decision that matters, and that's Mark Zuckerberg. And there's just so much that I can do to push back. And then she chooses the fights to fight. She chose to fight against, for example, the Mark Zuckerberg's green lighting of Holocaust denial on the website, essentially anti-Semitism. But that was the one thing, and she, personally, it matters a lot to her. So she did fight about that, but she, she knows that there's just so much she can There's so much she can do to push back. So that increases his personal power to, to an extent that is uh, quite scary, and especially if you tell us that he models himself after Caesar Augustus, an emperor yeah. like that. Uh, is there also a moment maybe uh, that really uh, marked a pivot into um, this attitude of Mark Zuckerberg becoming an all-powerful yeah. uh, leader within Facebook? 
I think an important moment was in the summer of 2018 when he gathered more than two dozen dozen of executives known as the M team, M team, known as the Mark team, M team, um, to a conference room. And he gave what was later described as the wartime leadership speech. The wartime leadership leadership speech, speech, right? Where he declared himself a wartime leader. He said, in moments of peace, there are certain kinds of leadership that you can have. A CEO can behave a certain way. And he actually had heard this from some of his people he admired, like Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel. He'd heard this also. I think he was much, somewhat inspired by, well, definitely by Ben Horowitz, one of the investors at Mark, um, Anders, Andres and Mark, Andres and Horowitz. Um, Andy, Andy Grove is known as, as one of the harshest uh, CEOs harsh in Silicon CEOs, Valley, successful, right? Successful, harsh, just like, also just like brute competition. And the idea is that if you're, if things are going really well, then you can do what Mark was doing before, which is de- delegate a ton of stuff to Cheryl. But they're in wartime, they're under siege. So under wartime conditions, a company requires a different kind of CEO. That requires a CEO who takes much more command of so many more aspects of the business, much more visi- visibly present. And Mark used to hate doing PR, doing being the one to defend the company, going to conferences. He just didn't like any of that. And he said, from this moment on, I'm going to be the wartime CEO. I'm going to make more of these decisions, the bigger decisions related to political speech, security, et cetera, data privacy. I'm going to talk sp- personally to regulators. I'm going to meet with you know, Macron and other people like, who are organizing big summits around digital safety. And that was a huge moment for him. And that was also a signal to the rest of the company that the person who everybody knew was already the most powerful individual there, who has 55% voting share of the company, who created the company in a way where the board is actually not really that powerful. And therefore, Mark's power really is that important as a 55% owner of shares. This was a moment where it was not just symbolic. In practice, he was seizing control as... But what does wartime mean in this sense? What does it entail in terms of uh, the leadership and the leadership style that he showed? It It meant him being much more involved in creating very important foundational policies on speech in particular. And this was a really important point. In, no, in October 2019, he gave a very important speech at Georgetown University declaring his position on political content and just generally his, his views on expression. And this was the first time he'd weighed so extensively on a policy position. He's informed a lot by his um, mentors, um, like Peter Thiel and, you know, Bill Gates is a mentor as well on the philanthropy side. But in this particular speech, he was also, he was also advised heavily by his lobbyists in Washington who were contending with the Trump administration that was really frustrated and angry at social media for censoring political views and their view, allegedly censoring. So Mark Zuckerberg, you know, at that point, he's still formulating his ideas on free expression it all, his ideas germinated from this sort of libertarian idea that exists in Silicon Valley. Peter Thiel and many others have this, this idea that, that free speech should be maximal speech. That Peter Thiel's on the board of Facebook. Peter one Thiel, of the, thank you, yes. Peter one Thiel of the, most one of the earliest investors on the board, well-known, a very divisive figure right now in the U.S. He's a big Trump supporter as well, but he's also well-known as a very early investor. Um, he was also an investor in PayPal, that's where he made his initial fortune. Um, and he's also known as one of the like, most prominent sort of libertarian thinkers right now. Yeah, so Mark Zuckerberg uses the wartime CEO-ship um, to uh, further his own political ideas on free speech. And that manifested quite clearly in the years after that. Yes. In what way, That's in, a great in what way did it matter that he took a wartime approach there instead of a peacetime approach? So... Because he decided what he, what he believed to be the best policy for Facebook would be the best policy. He would make the ultimate decision. I'll, give a, I'll continue a little bit just briefly on the, the Georgetown speech and why that was important. Then I'll give a little anecdote about Nancy Pelosi, which I think is really important. But in that speech, he essentially said, like, look, this is a very libertarian thought. Like, 
Free speech is so powerful and political speech is the most scrutinized speech that even if a politician lies or spreads misinformation, the public is, will scrutinize that speech, that essentially bad speech will be conquered by more speech. It's, it's essentially like the most brute basic calculus there. Um, so that was the foundation for essentially giving Donald Trump and other political leaders around the world in advertising as well as their own posts, a free pass. So they got white glove treatment. So if they, so if Donald Trump spread misinformation about say, you know, um, uh, Hunter Biden, which he did, Don, you know, Joe Biden's son, then they would not, Facebook would not fact, fact check it and they would not take down that, that speech or whatever that post well, was. Was that purely ideological? Because like you sketch in the book and, and also commonsensical, um, outrage creates attention and yeah. attention creates money for Facebook, right? So if you agitate your public enough, then uh, you will draw people back, you will draw their eyeballs back to their screens. Yeah, I mean, from our conversations with people, I think both can be true. It can be ideological. He truly believes he has a very specific worldview on expression, maximal expression view. But also the, the business of Facebook is to get you, I mean, I explain in many different ways what the business is, but also another way to think about Facebook's business is it's about agitation because agitation gets you to come back and it gets you to like and share and comment and join groups. And it can be positive agitation or negative agitation, but that is the business model. And political speech is very agitating, you know? And what Facebook does not want to do absolutely as a business is they never not want to be the center of conversation. They always want to be the center of conversation. They don't want Trump, Biden, whoever, to take their conversation elsewhere. They want to keep it on Facebook. So it was a very, very hard decision for a business, for it, the, and their motivations are business, but they also are ideological. Yeah. Because he it's truly quite, believes like, you don't want to be painted into a corner where you make one decision on a political leader and then you have to make that decision for everybody. Yeah, it's quite a troubling image that you lay out because uh, we all see how powerful one individual is, but over the course of the years, he became more uh, powerful. And he seems to um, have uh, ambition for more power. It seems quite explicitly so that he aspires to more power, right? Or Yeah, I, I think Mark Zuckerberg wants every individual in the world who has an internet connection to be on Facebook. He wants to create something that he believes. And, I, and even some of his greatest critics, like Chris Hughes, I talked to Chris Hughes at length, one of the co-founders, and he's like, Mark really believes it. He really believes that connecting the world would be a good thing. I think both can be true, though. You can believe it can be a good thing, and you can believe it's business. It's, there's a massive business incentive in doing that. And you can also believe that it's great in terms of historical impact. Like, all of these things can be true. But he does believe that in the end, he'll be judged well. Yeah. I would say we give uh, Cecilia a big uh, hand of applause. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you so much. Dutch tech reporter Wouter van Noort in conversation with the co-author of the book The Ugly Truth, Cecilia Kang. Did you know that you can go to our website, john-adams.nl slash videos, where there's a link to the video of this event. And we also have a newsletter you can sign up for and a treasure trove, as we always say, of great American thinkers and speakers at john-adams.nl. And while you're there, become a member of the John Adams. Not only do you support what we do, you get a discount to future live events. In the meantime, you should definitely go to wherever you get your podcasts and review this show. This will help get the word out and we can keep on sharing the very best of American thinkers with you, free of charge. That's it for this week's show. Our theme song is called La Prensa by the Parlandos. Our editor is Tracy Metz from Amsterdam. This was Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute. I'm Jonathan Gruber. Thank you for listening. <laughs>